Okay, so we're now recording. All right, great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hi, everyone. Who's that? Hi, Sue. Laura. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody. Yep. Okay, great. Um, in fact, we have everybody, don't we now? Um. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yes, yep. you do. Okay, great. Um, so welcome, uh, everybody. Thanks again for um, your time and effort and, and thinking on this. Uh, this is the uh, October 21st, 2022 Solar Bylaw Working Group meeting uh, for the town of Amherst, and um, happy to kick things off. Um, thanks, uh, Stephanie, for providing us the meeting packet. We have the agenda uh, open uh, or available to us. I, uh, I presume everybody has that and reasonably has that in front of us. Um, in addition to the normal activities on the agenda, we will also have an update um, and an introduction uh, and some time with our solar uh, consultant hired by the town, uh, GZA, and welcome them to the um, meeting. Uh, that will we'll kick off that uh, shortly, uh, and then we will start digging into uh, the work plan and our engagement with the planning department um, on the um, developing the the, uh, the bylaw and the process for uh, for doing that. I'm looking forward uh, to um, some background expert information and background on solar development from Laura um, later in the agenda. Where's Laura? There you are. Okay. I'm not shocking you, am I? You're, pretty, you're okay, good. <laughs> uh, awesome. So we look forward to that. Um, and then um, some time to um, talk about the uh, next agenda, uh, 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 agenda items, as well as hear from the public um, as we um, finish out the meeting um, uh, before three o'clock. Great. Uh, so uh, let me um, remind uh, Bob, um, you're on on for uh, notes uh, minutes today. So that's great. Um, I do know you need to leave promptly at three and my my uh, uh, <laughs> goal is to, is to uh, uh, adjourn us all at promptly at three. So hopefully that's not an issue. And just as a heads up, um, it would be um, Dan next uh, for the uh, for the minutes on on um, I think will be November fourth. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So, any issues or questions before we yeah. get going? With yeah. The for the minutes, can we introduce the guests? Say it again. For the minutes, can we introduce Stephen and Adrienne? Yeah, yes. Yes. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to do that now at the beginning or when we get to that agenda item? Um, uh, well, I, I was going to sort of wait until the agenda item, but we could do it now. I guess that's fine. Um, maybe, uh, Adrian, why don't you, I'll let you introduce yourself and then Steve, you can introduce yourself. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, my name is Adrian Dunk. I am a natural resource specialist with GZA, Geo Environmental, um, and I am the project manager for the Amherst Townwide Solar Assessment. Um, so we'll be working with, with this group and the town um, and the public to help develop um, a GIS-based model to understand solar capacity in town. And I'm, I'm Steve Lecko, also with GZA. I'll be working with Adrienne uh, on, on that project that she mentioned. Uh, I'm an associate principal. Uh, I'm a planner and an ecologist. So um, like I said, I'll be working with Adrienne on the uh, development of that GIS-based tool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, and we'll get to uh, uh, learn more about the assessment and the, the work plan uh, in a moment. Okay, uh, so first agenda item is to review and vote on the minutes from our last meeting, uh, October 7. Um, that was in our packet. Let me ask if there are any questions, comments, uh, concerns, um, suggested amendments to those minutes. Great. Um, if if not, um, I 
entertain a motion to accept those minutes. So move. So moved by Martha, thank you. Do we have a second? Janet is number two. <laughs> I'm not sure if we need a voice on that, but Janet will be the second. Um, and uh, and then we can vote on them. Okay, so and we should have voice votes. Um, just yeah. it's fine, but just in the future, we should probably have voice votes. Um, so I'll uh, in no particular order. Um, just need your vote on the minutes. So Brooks. Yes. Breger. Yes. Corcoran. Yes. Hanner. Yes. McGowan. Nice job. Yes. Jemsek. Yes. And Pagliarulo. Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Great, and I did want to um, thank Laura. Right, you you did the uh, minutes, uh, uh, so did. thank you for, yep. for those. Yep. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, staff updates, and we'll go with uh, Stephanie and then Chris. And and I, I like to also add um, just any quick updates from any of the committees that we represent. Um, I don't have any updates this week. All right, um, Chris, any any um, updates on your end? We'll be talking about the uh, uh, outline later that you uh, sent around, but yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Janet for the information that she sent me. She had been working on um, draft uh, a draft and um, she sent me all that information and that was helpful. Thank you. Great. Yep, thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I can just give a brief update from the uh, ECAC, Energy Climate Action Committee. We did talk about uh, solar at our last meeting and the, the uh, solar assessment. Um, uh, and we will also, as, as that committee will also be, have the opportunity to meet with GZA, um, maybe at our next meet. I'm not exactly sure if that's been scheduled yet. Yeah. Um, and uh, we did talk about, um, providing some input to GC, GZA with regard to um, some scenarios uh, with regard to how much uh, solar siting uh, would as a, as a um, uh, analytical exercise, um, uh, how we might go about basing um, uh, certain amounts of, of solar uh, hosting, capacity hosting that we would like to see um, to help meet our clean, uh, climate goals for the town. Um, uh, probably a couple scenarios on on uh, what that hosting capacity might look like, and then work with GZA uh, to help us to visualize what the options are for potentially hosting that type of capacity, that amount of capacity uh, within the town, given the um, potent, uh, technical potential that the uh, GIS exercise will provide. Uh, and so we are... Um, in, in the process of developing those scenarios uh, and we'll uh, make those available uh, and, and, to, and work with GZA on that when we um, have, have that available. Um, Dwayne, could you define hosting capacity just for um, the lay people like myself? Well, for, for ECAC, we thought it would be helpful um, to go through some analytical exercise um, to um, pull together a couple different um, uh, evaluations of of how much solar might make sense. Uh, these are not decisions or recommendations, but just an analytical exercise uh, based on several metrics um, uh, of of uh, to to ground in reality uh, some sense of uh, of what it might what might make sense for the town Amherst uh, to take on as their um, uh, share. Uh, cut different, cut cut in several different ways. Looking at it several different ways uh, of what um, the town might be, it might be reasonable to uh, want the town to host in terms of of uh, is it ten megawatts, is it fifty megawatts, is it a thirty megawatts or whatever? Uh, and we thought we would probably not specify a, a a specific goal, but provide a sort of low, medium, high range uh, to then be able to provide information to ourselves as a committee, uh, this committee or, or working group uh, and to town constituents uh, with regard to um, if we if we wanted to host this scale of uh, megawatts of, of uh, solar in within town, 
um, what are the different options we may have uh, with regard to um, the siting options that we do have, rooftops, parking lots, um, and and uh, and dis and uh, undisturbed land. So this is different from the um, G GZ A, just like how much solar capacity we have and where. It's 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 a different issue. Well, GZ, and we can get into GZA in a moment, but yeah, we can let them do that. But I, I just didn't. I, I'm not quite. I'm trying to understand the nuance between their work and ECAC. Okay. Yep. Well, GZA is going to provide a, a, an analytical tool uh, to to enable this type of of analysis to take place. Okay. Uh, in, in terms, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well. Great. Okay, uh, Martha. Sorry. Uh, yeah, then, uh, well, then, yeah, my question is, why is it ECAC that gets to do this and they get to define what targets the solar consultants should consider when our committee was supposedly has that charge and we were told we were not allowed to do that? We're not uh, ECAC. Well, for, for, for one, ECAC <laughs> well, maybe is just ECAC the way you presented it. I, I but but it, it strikes me as they're the ones involved and we're kind of not to discuss it. I, I don't I don't quite understand that. Um, ECAC is charged with um, developing and have developed a, 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 a carbon mitigation uh, a plan uh, for the for the town. And part of that, uh, one part of that uh, is um, to generate renewable energy within our borders. Uh, and amongst that is is uh, is solar and primarily solar in terms of what we have available. Uh, and so, you know, we want to come up with some sense of what it would what might make sense in terms of meet, helping to meet as a as as a component of meeting our greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, how much solar from from a, a, a climate from a, our climate uh, given our climate goals that ECAC has recommended and it, it has been adopted by the town. Uh, what scale of solar development would make sense to help uh, move the town uh, towards those uh, emission reduction goals? Now, again, we're not the, the this we're viewing this at this point as an analytical exercise, um, and, and and providing uh, information uh, to the town and to the town officials and to the town uh, town at, at large uh, with regard to. Um, uh, what it what it might look like uh, to host uh, this type of capacity in town? We're not advocating um, for any particular type of development at this point. That is really more the purview to some extent of this committee is how do we zone uh, for for um, uh, this uh, for solar coming our way um, in, in ways that are um, um, aligned with the preferences of the town. Uh, but we're not the ECAC exercise is not. Specifically engaged in in um, in um, the, 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 what what we're doing with regard to the zoning uh, for that solar hosting, but providing some guidance and I think useful information for this committee with regard to um, how how we should go about um, looking at the zoning um, uh, the zoning that we're going to be putting together. Yeah, well, maybe um, just ask then, Stephanie, have the have our GZA consultants been provided the uh, town manager's charge to this committee so they know what we're supposed to be about? Well, let me move on to, to Laura first and then, and then Stephanie had her hand up. Yeah, I just wanna quickly um, chime in and say, and thanks for taking questions um, in order, but I think that um, one of the things I'm gonna to discuss today, cause I feel like there's a a general and understandable lack of understanding and how um, much available capacity there is in our region of the state. So I'm gonna briefly take you guys through um, how any sort of solar developer would look to see what substations are here, how much capacity is available, and then the work that's entailed to actually confirm that that capacity is available. Because you know, I just think at a sort of a high level here, what strikes me almost at every single meeting is that there's this um, inaccurate belief that we can say, we want solar here and here and here, but in reality, if there's no capacity with the utility, it can't go there at all. Yeah. So, I mean, that's like the main, that's like a, a critical piece. So anyways. Yeah, we'll I, I would just, I would just 
add to that, Laura, maybe is that, you know, our our, our charge from ECAC and, and, and this committee is not necessarily looking at where solar can go today or tomorrow or in the next five years even, but um, over more of a long period. I mean, 2050 tends to be the goal for the for the um, for the town and for the for the Commonwealth. And so, um, you know, I, I think there's expectation that at least Commonwealth wide uh, distribution lines need to be um, enhanced to support the distributed generation that is is expected. So I, I do see that as a as a limitation to development today, but um, maybe less of a constraint um, as we look sort of forward into into um, <clears throat> time well enough in the future that that sort of change might might take place. Stephanie. Um, doing if I might. So I just want to sort of get to Martha's question earlier and sort of reduce this as to the most basic, simple response that I can, which is the ECAC proposed a solar assessment right out the gate back in 2019 when they convened, even before these other issues came to light. Um, and they talked about a, needing a, some kind of a solar bylaw. So that those are discussions that they had well before this committee even convened. So there's that, but also they're charged with actually trying to identify the, the amount of solar that we can have. That is something they've been charged with to sort of look at what, what do we need in town. This group is specifically charged with trying to identify where the restrictions might be to put it. It's more about the, the zoning guidance of like where, where could we um, legally put it, where can't we put it? So you're more the guide, you're creating the guidance of when someone wants to put solar in town, where does it go? Where can it go? That's what your committee's charged with. They're two different things. They both have a role. They're both equally important. So I just don't want to get hung up on this. What do they get to do and we don't get to do? It, it doesn't really serve us. I think we're very clear. I think staff is clear on trying to get the right parties, the information that we need to sort of move us along. So you have a very vital role, but I think theirs is a little bit different. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, I just feel sometimes a kind of a lack of information, but also, you know, I would I would say that the uh, ECAC has done a lot of good work, still doing a lot of good work and conscientious, but their plan was before the uh, state of Massachusetts put out the uh, June 2022 uh, climate plan with the near-term goals, which really shifted the emphasis a bit and so I think that's also something to consider when saying, oh, how much should Amherst have? So on, thank you. And thank you um, for the comments and, and Stephanie for the clarification, that's really helpful. Um, <clears throat> so any other uh, updates or comments from, uh, from any of the other committees that are represented? Super, okay. Uh, Great. So let's move on to the next agenda item, which is hearing from GZA. Um, and uh, basically, um, we're looking for sort of an introduction, um, a, an overview of their of the, of the project that they uh, are uh, just embarking on now, uh, the scope of work and so forth. Um, and then, as we do know, um, they through uh, Stephanie provided us with a draft set of questions. Importantly, these are questions. These, these are questions for the department heads. They're not questions for the public. Um, they th those will come later, and we'll have a chance to uh, provide some input on those later. Um, and so uh, we can have a discussion on these questions from the department head, or or, or figure out how we're going to provide some feedback. But it's in my mind a very different purpose of these questions than the questions for the public. Uh, but uh, Stephanie, do you want to introduce um, the? GZA work with uh, at all, or just should I turn it over to Adrian? I think Adrian will do just fine. Okay. <laughs> so, and Adrian, if I can just ask if you have some slides, can you just get them to me so I can add them to the meeting packet? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, I'm going to share my screen now um, and set this to presentation mode. Great. So, um, as as we said in the introduction. Um, I'm Adrian Dunk, I'm with GZA and um, Steve Lecko is also here. So we are working on this townwide solar assessment. Um, I think Dwayne kind of summed it up perfectly that it's an analytical exercise, um, not focused on you know, what should be done, um, not focused on recommendations, but really just a quantitative exercise to understand 
what land is available in town. Um, so we have a primary team of three people, um, Steve, myself, and then Jacqueline Claver. She is our GIS, so that's a geospatial information systems uh, specialist. She will be doing the core mapping work um, based off of the information we gather throughout this project. Um, so as a project overview, um, I really think about this project having three phases. Um, so we're in this first phase of gather right now. And we're gonna be gathering feedback from you, from ECAC, from the town government, and also from direct public participation um, through both online engagement and in-person engagement. Using that information, um, we are going to develop an interactive map-based tool. So that's where that geospatial data comes in. Um, to help people visually understand kind of what land types are in town and how that relates to solar. And then ultimately, we are going to issue a report which describes our process, describes the decisions made, and also um, characterizes the data that's available in the map. So the map and the report are very closely related, um, and they are going to be created based on um, the, the data gathering we're doing today and we're doing in this phase. Um, we, we view this meeting as just an introduction um, with your group, and we will be back for a more content in-depth um, discussion later as the, as the project progresses. Um, so today our goal is to get um, introdu introduce ourselves and also to get feedback on questions that we have written for the town department heads. So um, we'll go over those questions. And what we're really looking for is um, input from your group that's been kind of compiled um, and, and given to us through Stephanie. Um, that'll help us have a clear directive um, instead of us trying to figure out maybe like what, what one person meant or what a comment means. Um, by going through Stephanie, we'll have a nice clean um, communication channel. Um, some of the questions, if you do wish to respond to them, uh, we just ask that that come in writing, um, but we are certainly happy and open to hearing or, or getting your feedback at this stage, but do know um, the questions we're going over today are for the department heads, um, so they may not feel super applicable to you directly, um, but we'll be back in the future to gather more in-depth input. So at, when we meet with the department heads, we wanna use these questions to really facilitate our discussion and our conversation with them. Um, so we've, we've issued, we think there's uh, five statements here that they can quickly um, give us, you know, a strongly disagree to strongly agree. And these are really about um, to help us understand how the, the town, you know, the town department heads understand solar how they understand how solar will change their jobs um, and how they, um, you know, how, how we can make our analytical exercise and our results um, easier for them to understand and implement and respond to. So these questions are mostly about if they've already had experience with solar, um, if solar may change their, their work um, or change some of the responsibilities of them or their staff. If they're comfortable using mapping tools um, and if they, um, again, have had that direct experience. We're also inviting them to submit a little bit more of a free form response. Um, I'm expecting, you know, a couple of uh, sentences max on each one of these uh, from department heads to kind of expand on some of their the things that they are maybe concerned about or excited about um, related to solar development. Um, so we, we've brought these questions to your group today so that um, you're informed of what's going on, you're kept in the loop. And if you think that um, these questions maybe are missing a topic um, from your experience in town, um, that's that would be really great information so that we can know that we're asking good questions to, to start our data gathering. Um, so I'm gonna keep 
sharing this, but I'm going to expand the uh, participants so I can I can see you all. Um, I think first off, are there any um, specific questions? I see Robert Brooks, you have your hand up. Yes, yeah, so I just want to know if this, doc, this um, slideshow will be available on our resource page. I will provide this slideshow to Stephanie, um, but I'm, uh, Stephanie, can you respond to that? Yes, so once it's provided to me, it goes, as soon as I, any presentations that occur during the meeting are put into the online packet. So it's always in the online packet and I'll forward it to the group as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Um, and great, Martha, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, just interested to know, what do you expect to learn from these particular questions to department heads? I mean, I picture the head of the recreation department or DEI or various places. I just wonder what they are going to uh, help you to understand. Yes, we're we're hoping to understand, um, you know who who's going to be impacted by solar development throughout town, and so help us understand, you know who who should be engaged in this process, and and who maybe this process won't touch so much. Maybe they're not they're less engaged, um, and then also to understand um, in terms of feasibility, if there are planned projects in the town that may make solar um, more feasible or less feasible. So just to help us understand the town-wide planning and, um, and, and future development needs. I mean, it seems, uh, you know, the planning department would be the, you know, main, most important people. The fire department might be concerned about, you know, battery installations, but I'm, um, I just had a little trouble picturing what some of the other departments might be able to um, contribute to you. Right. And because we, um, you know, I don't know every department and what exactly what their role is. That's why we want to start very inclusive and, and get this out to all the department heads. Um, that way they can kind of self-select into continuing to coordinate with us um, because there may be um, departments that that we don't think ha we, we don't realize have um, a direct relationship to this, but maybe they do. Um, and so that way we're going to start with a wide net so that anybody who who would be engaged in solar and other development in town has the opportunity to weigh in. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Any Great. Um, any other um thoughts or comments for Adrian, um, Super Janet? Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad Martha asked that question because I was a little confused about the goal since, you know, our committee is looking at trying to figure out what the community values are and to prioritize locations. That's sort of, a set, that's later. Um, I thought that in quest, the second um, question to the second set of questions, was what possibility am I most excited about relative to increasing solar development in Amherst, which is very positive. And then I thought maybe a question that might help you understand what's going on in the community might be what concerns have been raised about solar by staff and residents. And so you might get an answer from the fire chief um, about what they're worried about. You might get an answer from um, Christine Brestep, our planning director, about the attempt to get a solar moratorium and what people were saying. And so it might give you more background into, um, you know, whatever. And then we also have a lot of really exciting work going on at the university and colleges on solar. So that might give you some more information on that. So, so concerns, positives, or, you know, past experiences, I think would cover a lot. That's, that's my input. Great. Thank you. Yes, I think that's, that's helpful. Great. I just um, wanted to um, you, you in your in before we got to the questions, you talked about the GIS exercise to sort of look at the land and everything. Uh, I just wanted to uh, maybe comp you to comment a bit more uh, about the um, intent and, and uh, uh, scope to, to look at the built environment as well, because obviously that's going to be is very important to uh, this group, ECAC and, and the town as a whole. Yes, we will be looking at both the built and unbuilt environment. Um, and so we are 
yeah, we'll be characterizing what exists um, and then and then helping contextualize what capacity that that could relate to. Um, but we are we're not veering into um, more of those community and value driven decisions. Um, this is a, kind of a neutral um, analytical tool that you all can use in decision making. Thank you. Great. So I think if there's um, no more questions right now, um, Steve and I can will will sign out of the meeting. But definitely, if there's any more discussion, I've taken um, some notes. But any, any other discussion on adjusting these questions, um, if that can just be sent to Stephanie, and I know she will um, get it over to us. We're going to have a very similar meeting with ECAC next week, um, and then we will begin meeting with um, the town department heads. Uh, Janet, I see your hands up. Thank you. Um, I thought the presentation was going to be longer, so I had other, another question. So, um, so your your solar assessment, your first step is just is the just look at us. What's there? Rooftops, utility rights of way, farms, you know, whatever, um, you know, open land. And then, is there a community engagement piece that you'll be doing later? Um, Yes. In terms of surveys and questions. So that we're not discussing that right now. That piece comes later. Um, okay. I okay. So is that later? And then I have a second question. Yes, we are doing community engagement and outreach. Um, and that will be before the mapping is completed. So that information will be used in the mapping. Um, so we're starting, yeah, we're starting with um the committees in the town. Um, to get some understanding of of the technology, of the um, the needs of obviously engaged citizens like yourselves, and then we'll be going to the broad um, public to everyone in town. So that that sort of leads to my second question because I got um, I read the UMass Clean Energy Institute kind of solar process, and it seemed to me that the assessment, the solar assessment, would come first, and then the community would be provided with information and then surveyed. And we are like a very information dense community. Um, I think Christine will, and, and um, Stephanie will attest to that or anybody who lives here. And so I wonder, um, you know, have you done that later or have you done this process before in tandem and how has that worked? The other question is, can we, can we see your proposal or maybe Stephanie can send us your proposed like kind of overall proposal too, but. So my question is merely about sequencing. I was sort of expecting community engagement to come after the assessment. So we, we've done um, community engagement in many of our projects and generally we work with a more um, involved group of citizens to help get sort of a draft together to get uh, some of the structural decisions made. And then we use that to develop a prototype or you know a draft version that we use to engage with the community. That way the community is involved at the decision-making stage um, instead of kind of after it's completed. And so we find that that, that iterative process of having um, some more targeted engagement, a draft material, and then broad engagement before finalizing um, our report and mapping and assessment is, is a great way to go so that people are engaged early and often. Mm -hmm. Um, and Martha, I see your hand up too. Uh, yes, yes, just following on then. I mean, I guess, as you know, our chair here is indeed head of the uh, clean energy e extension at, at UMass. And so have you uh, studied, uh, for example, their uh, report on conducting focus groups for solar planning? Because it seems that, you know, a lot of thinking has already been done. There's no need for you to have to start from scratch if you can you know, use other material. Um, yes, we use, we use other material. We've been coordinating with Dwayne. Um, and then we also have done um, similar outreach efforts, uh, especially around, you know, other resiliency concerns um, with towns. So we do have experience in doing the outreach and the focus groups um, on a, a variety of topics. And we'll bring that, that experience to bear here. Yeah. Great. And I'm I'm always available, Andrea, to help you um, to talk to you about what we came up with 
um, <clears throat> I think taking some of your expertise, what we've come up with, um, uh, can can help um, everybody learn together on on how to um, conduct um, uh, useful, in, insightful uh, surveys uh, for the town. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And for your uh, for your actual uh, technical work, uh, I wonder, could you say at this point a little about what criteria you plan to use to judge whether a site is, is suitable for solar? I know, you know, Laura has already mentioned, for example, you know, whether the, um, you know, transmission lines and so on are in place, but uh, could you say anything about the criteria? Um, so we, we're still in the draft. Uh, very draft phase of that. So we, we are working up our final list of criteria. Um, but I think very importantly, we are not necessarily looking at the suitability of a site. We're looking at the feasibility from a physical standpoint. Um, so exactly, we will be looking at the, the, um, the grid, the energy grid and its capacity to take solar energy on, um, distance from substations, uh, slope, um, mm -hmm. things that we that, that go into the direct uh, feasibility of installing solar panels. But we are not um, tasked with, and we don't want to put our own um, thoughts ahead of the, the town and the communities on, on what is a suitable area for solar. I see. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good distinction. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Laura? Yeah, so I had a question uh, about that last point. So it sounds as though you're going to do sort of some, I would assume, like desktop analysis using GIS to determine leveraging Eversource and national grid maps, you know, where capacity is available and so forth. Dwayne um, kicked off the call talking about how um, his opinion, which I am not as optimistic, um, with utility upgrades of lines. Um, are you accounting for any capacity upgrades, you know, cost sharing, or how deep is your study going on the engineering component? Um, so we have not defined exactly the, the depth of the study in that area. Um, we will be, that's part of what is gonna be in the report is really contextualizing our findings and saying, okay. you know, there, there appears to be this much capacity in in maybe surface area, but these are some limitations right. or these are some, you know, upgrades that would be necessary to kind of unlock that full potential. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's more in the reporting final phase is, is contextualizing the geographic findings. That part's really interesting. I didn't know that was a part of your work. So that's really exciting. And I assume um, that, so just having developed solar for so long, um, frequently the maps by Eversource and National Grid are totally inaccurate. I mean, well, not totally, um, you know, sort of high level, you know, and then you dig into a study with the utility and it shows something different, but it sounds as though you have access to um, additional data where, you know, you could sort of assess, you know, potential upgrade requirements, costs, or, you know, um, things like that. Are you going to that level or, or not so much? I don't no. think at this time okay. we can go into that level because, okay. you know, I, I think that that would require sure, a lot of sure. information from Eversource and National Grid that they that's, that's what I thought. Keep it, maybe keep don't want to share. Yeah, no, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, we don't have any, no trade secrets, unfortunately. Um, Janet? So I, I, I just love community engagement and I know it's, hard to do and we have and at the same time we have a lot of resources for it um i've been collecting a list of like groups to send to a survey or putting some thoughts into maybe focus groups and so i just want to um offer that as assistance as the process goes on because we have there's lots of little networks and you know the league of women voters has a great outreach and things like that so i'm putting that putting that little list together and i'm hoping that could help you when you're in your more deeper community outreach phase so that sounds wonderful. Yes, we'll be um, coordinating that with the town with Stephanie, and so I'm I'm definitely going to note that down um, to tap into these existing networks. Um, Stephanie, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, that that would be great, Janet. And yes, you should definitely um, because I think we're going to want to look to that information from 
you all also from the ECAC, I know that they have a list of groups when we were putting together the climate action adaptation and resiliency plan. We had some task groups that we worked with. So we had a whole list of community organizations and members. So we would just compile one list, but it should all come through me and then I'll provide it to them. So thank you, that would be wonderful. All right, well, thank you all so much for your time. Um, I will stop sharing here. Um, any any additional feedback or input, um, we would love to hear it. So please just get that over um, to Stephanie. She's been wonderful at getting us information. So we look forward to continuing um, to coordinate with her and with you all throughout this process. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Adrian and, and uh, 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 Stephen for um, joining us today and giving that um, uh, introduction to, to the work um, and, and moving forward. Uh, looking forward to um, continuing to stay abreast of the work and, and engage in the work. Wonderful, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, I think we uh, at this point we, we sort of expressed one one uh, suggestion on the on the on the uh, set of questions. I think they noted that down. Um, I would su suggest that um, in the course of the next um, week or so, uh, if anybody ha has any um, um, input or thoughts on the questions, this again for the department heads, it's it's going to be you know different than the questions for the general public and and engagement. Uh, but if anybody has any thoughts on that, uh, do send them to, to me and Stephanie and we can accumulate those together. All right. Okay, very good. Um, so let's move on to the uh, next agenda item, uh, which is um, getting down to the, the, to the work at hand for the next few uh, months, um, which is... Um, uh, but sort of at, at a high level and, and beginning level here of our, our work plan and and how we as a working group will be engaging with the planning department uh, to develop this um, uh, uh, bylaw. Um, I'm not sure if it got distributed to the whole group, Chris or Stephanie, but I, I did do see that Chris came up with a uh, an outline to get us going, which is greatly appreciated. Um, and we can take a look at that um, today if that was the plan. Um, uh, but, um, um, but I thought we would go through sort of the, the, um, uh, sort of developing this, uh, this, this outline, um, and then, and then talk a little bit about our deliberative process together over the course of the months in front of us, uh, with regard to, I, I thought it'd be helpful maybe just to have a open conversation about some of the high level principles that we want to just generally adhere to and, uh, used to balance our our um, thoughts and deliberations and and ultimately decision making, uh, and then talk a little bit more pragmatically about um, how are we going to put um, pen to paper, fingers to keyboards, um, in this writing process in in coordination with the planning department, and 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 deliberate on um, the, the I wouldn't say innumerable but quite a few like specific decisions that ultimately would need to be made. Um, so do you want me to talk about um, what I've done so far? Yes, yeah, that would be excellent. And that was going to be my next thought is, uh, um, you know, we're really um, happy and pleased and thankful and appreciative to be working with the planning department um, that has a lot more experience than we do on um, bylaws. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, yeah, Chris, that would be great if you can give us some some of your thoughts and sort of where we're at at this point. Uh, but before you do that, I do see Stephanie's hand up. Uh, so maybe she has something to help us get started. I just wanted to ask Chris if she wants me to share it now or do you want to just discuss it and then put it in for the next meeting? I think it looks like we have some time. I wasn't sure if we would have time. Okay. Um, what time do you think Laura will want to start her presentation? Around one o'clock or so? Or two o'clock, rather, maybe. I defer to Laura for that. I'm flexible, guys. You have me until three. All right. So why don't I start talking and maybe talk for twenty minutes or so? Okay. So I'll 
I'm going to share my screen then and share the document so everyone can see it. And I'll just tell me when you want me to move along, Chris. Okay. So generally speaking, what we do here in the planning department is we look at a lot of different um, bylaw examples when we're trying to formulate one for ourselves and, um, you know, just kind of pick what we think is are the good things from um, many different bylaws and you know we don't want to reinvent the wheel every time so we base our um, work on what other people have already done to a large degree and we see whether we like it or not and whether it will fit in with our um, you know the way we do things here in, in Amherst and so I've looked at a lot of different bylaws um, Janet uh, started drafting a bylaw and that was helpful and then we have the model bylaws from um, Cape Cod Commission from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and also from um, the DOER Department of Energy Resources I believe this it is um, so anyway here are just you know some general uh, sections that we would expect to have in our solar bylaw. They may not all be in this particular order and things may get shuffled around, but we can kind of talk about, um, you know, what, what I've put down on paper to date. And then, you know, we'll be filling in these sections with material that is relevant. So um, in terms of the purpose and intent, you know, we want to give a, a really strong um, statement about why we're doing this. And some of this will help to um, support uh, any regulations that we have. So, you know, we want to um, talk about uh, health, safety, and welfare, but we also want to talk about Amherst has an intent to um, be carbon neutral by 2050, I think. And so a lot of different, uh, or I shouldn't say a lot of different, several things will be put into this purpose and intent that will help to support our um, regulations and requirements as we move forward. Because if we don't have a clear statement of what we're trying to do, then uh, <clears throat> some of the things we do down the line may appear to be arbitrary or capricious. So we want to bring them back to um, a clear statement of purpose and intent. So that's what that's all about. And that can be a fairly long section or you know short depending on how many things we want to include and how elaborate we want to get um applicability i think applicability is really going to be talking about large scale solar installations ground mounted solar installations and um, that was the mandate that we were given um, we weren't given a mandate to control um, in this bylaw um, things that happen on rooftops um, so or things that happen in residential locations such as uh, single family homes. So we're really gonna be focusing on large scale um, ground mounted solar installations. So that's going to be explained in the applicability section here. Um, definitions, in definitions, we're gonna have lots of different definitions. Some, of, some definitions that we already have in the zoning bylaw are in section 12, article 12. And those definitions can be used throughout the bylaw. But if there are things that relate particularly to the solar um, world that aren't you know, commonly used in the bylaw, we would uh, put the definitions in here, such as a definition of what exactly is a large scale ground mounted solar array. And, and there will be other things as well. Um, so in terms of general requirements, you know, we're going to require that whatever is built, in addition to following our particular zoning bylaws, also follow other laws such as wetlands regs and building uh, code and um, other regulations that the town has with regard to building things in town. So that's what compliance with laws ordinances and regulations is all about. And then we're going to um, require that these installations have a building permit and that they be able to be inspected by the inspection services department. Um, there will be fees associated with these, um, these applications and some of the fees are already spelled out in the Zoning Board of Appeals and, and Planning Board um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, application forms, but we may have other fees that are associated with this, such as um, 53G fees, which um, what chapter 53G, Mass General Law 53G, um, has to do with is when a, 
um, a board like the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board wants to hire a third party reviewer for a certain aspect of a project, then um, this explains, you know, how do you go about collecting the fees? And it, what usually happens is that the board determines that they need extra help in a particular area, and it could be erosion control, it could be the issue of glare, it could be the issue of screening, number of different issues that we want to get outside help on. And then we have the ability to, um, the board has the ability to require the applicant to put in escrow a certain amount of money to allow this third party review to happen. And the town hires the third party reviewer and pays that consultant out of these fees. So some of that will be described in this section. Then we would want to have a section um, to describe exactly how these things are permitted by um, boards and committees that are related to our department. And one type of review would be site plan review by the planning board. Another type of re review would be a special permit by the Zoning Board of Appeals. I think most, um, most solar installations in Amherst right now are governed by special permit by the Zoning Board of Appeals, but you do occasionally have um, an installation that's not a small installation, such as the one at Hampshire College, <clears throat> which is a, an accessory use. So that was actually reviewed by the planning board under site plan review. So we would have a description of what that is about. And then we'd have um, a description of exactly what needs to be submitted in order to um, begin this review process. And the submittals um, usually require, you know, um, drawings by a registered engineer, um, and sometimes registered landscape architects and sometimes architects get involved uh, in, in electrical engineer, uh, civil engineer. Um, and then there are documents related to um, how are you going to manage the project, um, how are you going to build it. So there's a whole list of documents that would be required to be submitted along with an application. And then there may be other um, required submittals. And it's unclear exactly what those would be, but it depends on the specific project, such as you could um, require a hazardous materials plan be submitted and a, an emergency, you know, a plan for dealing with emergencies. So those are other types of submittals that you can require, which I think should be required in, in the case of solar. Um, and then there would be dimensional requirements. Um, you know, what are our setback requirements going to be? Setbacks from property lines or setbacks from residences. Um, and setbacks could be from side lot lines or from roadways. So those things all need to be determined. They would also, dimensional requirements would also include how much of the lot can be covered with a structure. And these solar um, arrays are considered structures. So they come under lot coverage and um, building coverage requirements. Um, what else? How high can they be? Um, how high can the fence be? That kind of thing comes under dimensional requirements. Design and performance standards. So we would want to uh, get um, information from the applicant about what are his plants or his her plants for screening and fencing of the property, though those are kind of two different things. Fencing is obviously to keep the site secure, but screening is to keep it from being seen from everywhere. Um, storm preparedness, that has to do with making sure that the insulation is done in a manner that if there is a storm, that these structures are <clears throat> capable of withstanding, you know, whatever wind or rain or snow happens to come upon them. Um, then there would be requirements for land clearing. What kinds of um, things do we want the co contractor to follow when he is doing, you know, trying to keep the site stable? Um, stormwater management is also part of that. How, how will the applicant handle stormwater? And um, that would require, you know, that there be catchment areas in various locations to contain the stormwater, to keep it from running off the site. Um, Erosion control is another thing. 
Obviously, during construction, erosion control is important, but post-construction, it's also important because you don't want um, a storm to you know, wash out a site after it's been uh, constructed. There could be a section on um, the types of plantings that um, the town would like to have and how um, animals might be controlled. And uh, you know, sometimes there are particular requirements for using or not using um, herbicides and um, other um, mechanisms for controlling animals and plants. Um, but then there's also the question of allowing animals to go through the site. So, you know, how high is the fence off the ground in order to allow the animals to migrate? And then um, we do know that there are occasions when solar installations do um, I, I know of one in particular that has been a problem, and so we need to put something in the bylaw to talk about what level of noise is allowed, and then if it's greater than that, how, how does that get mitigated, or how do, do the noise control requirements get enforced? Um, site control, that has to do with uh, the developer proving to the board that's reviewing the application that they actually have control over the site. And then that could be in the form of a lease. It could be in the form of a purchase and sale agreement or some document that says, yes, they are allowed. Um, they, they have permission from the property owner or they're in uh, you know, negotiation with the property owner or some, something to indicate that they actually have the ability to do this on this property. Um, then there would be an operation and maintenance plan that would talk about how does this installation, how is this installation operated? How often would um, people from the company come out and make sure that everything is in working order and, and you know, make sure that it's, it's operating properly and then maintaining it with regard to, you know, um, vegetation clearing or whatever type of maintenance needs to be done. Um, the applicant would also obviously have to prove that he has been in touch with the utility that's going to um, be connecting to the installation because we don't want something to be built and then not have assurance that it can actually be used. Um, there are safety and environmental uh, standards that we need to deal with, such as control of hazardous waste. Are there hazardous wastes that are generated as a result of uh, the construction or might hazardous waste uh, be an issue, um, you know, as the project is operating. And then if there's a fire or an emergency, how does that get uh, handled? So we would look to the applicant to explain how he would cope with these things and then obviously have those um, plans reviewed by the fire department and inspection services. Um, <clears throat> the town would want to uh, have a monitoring maintenance um, report or excuse me, a program plan from the applicant and then have some kind of reporting and reporting could be done both by the applicant himself with, um, you know, regular site visits and reports being submitted to the town or we could require that there be a third party that could um, monitor the site and report and that is important both during construction because the ground is going to be um, disturbed or and also um, after construction. So we want to make sure that the site maintains its um, stability and doesn't become uh, washed away by, by occasional storms. And we want to have these things reported to the town. And then it's important to um, deal with the topic of abandonment and decommissioning. I noticed I put abandonment twice here, but abandonment essentially means that the developer walks away or the operator walks away from the site. Um, and then what do we do about that? And decommissioning is um, when the uh, applicant no longer wants to operate the site. How, how does he have to remove the materials that are there? Um, and in terms of both of these, we would require um, the posting of a bond. And normally what we do here is that we, um, we have a certain time frame that we attach to this. So the, the applicant would come up with an estimate for um, what, how much would it cost to decommission this project. And then we project into the future a certain number of years for um, inflation. 
you know, what would this cost in 20 years to take this thing down? And the um, inspection services receives a bond that would cover the cost of doing this um, if and when it becomes necessary. <coughs> then we would have a section on what happens if the site is transferred from the, uh, from the original developer to a different owner and how things might change. Um, then some, um, some of the bylaws that I looked at have this lapse of approval um, phrase, and it has to do with um, normally a special permit or site plan. So if you don't make, you know, some progress in that two year period, then your permit lapses. That's about. And then enforcement, who enforces all of these things? And in our case, it's probably going to be the building commissioner's office and um, the fire department who would enforce the, the requirements. So these are the things that I am um, thinking would go into the zoning bylaw, um, but there may be other things as well that will come up over time as we discuss this. And so we'll start you know, filling in these sections with um, material. And some of it's going to be kind of boilerplate and other things will be um, choices that the town has to make. For instance, some towns say you can't cut more than 10 acres of forest and some towns don't have any limitation on the amount that you can cut. Some towns say you can't have a solar, a large scale solar array that is larger than X acres other towns don't have that requirement. So those are the kinds of things that, details that we're gonna have to late and easily kind of um, constructed without a lot of discussion. So that this is what I'm thinking about now. And I'm sure that there will be things that we need to add as we go along. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's really helpful uh, to see this taking shape and and your um, help and leadership in, in getting us uh, organized uh, in this way. Let me, Stephanie, you put your hand down, I take it, right? Yeah, okay. Um, great. So um, I, I want to go in a little bit in terms of uh, sort of, uh, you know, now that sort of we have um, Chris's input and, and, and thoughts in terms of the outline, uh, obviously, we want to sort of um, uh, discuss that, think about that, anything that we think might be missing in terms of these large categories. Um, and I do wanna talk a little bit about, okay, so what is the plan now in terms of uh, um, putting in, putting putting the language in, as you say, Chris, some of it's um, um, uh, standard language uh, that, um, uh, uh, that you can, um, uh, draw from other other places from your own zo zoning that we already have or from some of these model uh, bylaws uh, that we can incorporate and, and start drafting that way. But I, I want to get into a little bit in terms of the pragmatics of actually who's who's doing that. Is that us or is that the planning department that brings that to us uh, just so we can um, understand that process. But before we get into that, and I do want to you know, maybe maybe about just five or 10 minutes here because I want to leave enough time for Laura and then public comment. Um, let me, because this will be something we'll, we're going to be working on for the next months. Um, but let me um, just see if there's any uh, initial comments, thoughts for uh, Chris and I see Janet. So Chris, thank you for that unbelievably clear and simple, simple explanation. Um, speaking as somebody who is in the trenches of looking at different bylaws and trying to follow along with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission draft, um, I, you know, I, so, you know, the question, it, I sort of had an epiphany way too late in the process, but one of the ideas I had was, um, we're all going to be looking at this language at some point. It's kind of, you know, for the boilerplate, you know, boilerplate, it's like, you know, you can do this, this and that or something. And it's usually very numbing to read, um, you know, but there's, there are a lot of points where it was like, you could do this, you could do that, that will come out of the public process about what's important and things like that. But I thought that like, in terms of background reading, I thought that um, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, it's kind of like saying, it sort of takes you through these sections and says, you can do that, you can do this. 
super confusing about site plan review and special permit. And that just was really, I think, not to worry about, but I found it very, you know, I think it'd be confusing to a lay person. I thought the Cape Cod Commission draft was so much easier to read and better written and like the writing itself was more simpler, simple. So I would recommend that one if you wanted to get grounded in, oh, this is what a bylaw can look like, here are the main areas. And it does have that back and forth. You can decide this, you can decide that. And I think part of the reasons it's better than the Pioneer Valley Commission, because the Cape Cod people looked at that one and the DOR and somebody else's. And so they had the combined, like they were able to simplify it and make it more clear. So I think if people on the committee wanted to read something, I would probably start with the Cape Cod Commission. Um, and then the Athol Tufts thing is, I think it's long, but it's kind of, to me, very user-friendly about how you do a community, take the solar assessment, your community engagement process and how it affects your bylaw. I don't think we're going to wind up where they wound up because, you know, they were super concerned about views and, you know, keeping their, um, you know, what they considered their re a kind of an economic development resource. Also, they got their major ridges had, you know, projects on it and everybody was agitated. So you could sort of see how that, you know, how the, there was an assessment, there was a community engagement process, and then they showed options for the bylaw, how to implement that. And so I think that's really user-friendly for a lay reader about how this process could go, or how you can shape a bylaw. Um, but I do think that, you know, we're not, we're not Athol, but, you know, we might have Athol-like aspects to it. So I don't know, I just, I kept on thinking, like, if you weren't an attorney, I mean, it was very dense and confusing, um, but I just thought, I think Cape Cod Planning Commission might be the best thing to read if you were going to read one thing. And then Athol Tufts is kind of, interested in how they integrated their process into their results and their assessment community process results. I, I, know, I wonder if Chris would agree with that or not. Do you want me to comment on that? Um, if you'd like, I don't, I don't think we wanna get into um, deliberations or, or preferences or perspectives quite at this point, because I think we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of time and plenty of need to do that when we get to the specifics uh, uh, of the uh, of the sections that we're writing. So, you know, if you have any sort of just general feedback, I, I appreciate what Janet said in terms of, uh, I wasn't aware that the Cape Cod one was the third, was, was after PVPC. Um, and so they had the advantage of, of seeing that ahead of time. So um, that 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 is useful information. Um, I think all of us, I mean, I've, I've looked at, um, I actually looked at the PVPC one more carefully. So I'll look at the Cape Cod one more carefully um, as well. Uh, I think we should have both of those um, in mind and available to us as we sort of go, uh, go through the process. Um, but um, uh, but I, I don't want to get into the details of any any sort of preferences or or uh, perspectives yet. Okay. Um, what I would like to do, and and I do want to uh, sort of cut this fairly short because we're going to be in this in the trenches here for a while, but just a, a sense um, from you, Chris, maybe in terms of what what we do versus what the planning department does with regard to sort of starting to put the uh, words on the page, um, and and then how how uh, and then and then um, how do we sort of work together as a deliberative body to to uh, uh, provide decisions on 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 certain things uh, that go in and certain numbers and specifications and so forth that need to be decided upon um and and uh, and with that with the outline which is super helpful uh and whether you know that remains our outline or we add some things or not i, I think we'll, we'll 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 work on that as we go forward uh my sense is we kind of want to I, I don't know if it's chronological order right from the beginning or the end or whether you go back and you do the definitions afterwards you know what needs to be defined uh we'll always want to uh maybe uh look at the purpose um statement not only at the beginning but i suspect at the end as well uh to sort of make sure that stay, we, we stay true and in tuned with that but it's an important section for us to think about i think at the beginning to sort of guide ourselves um, but um, Chris, what's your thought in terms of of um, how we might, as a body and with the planning department, sort of start rolling this out in terms of language to actually um, work on and react to and and fill in the gaps? 
So normally what we do is the planning department staff drafts um, bylaws and then brings them to whatever body they're working with. So that's what I would expect in this case. So we would start, you know, putting, filling in those sections and submitting them to you. And we could have some parts of these ready for the next meeting, which is when? When's the next meeting? In, in two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks from today. Yep. So, okay. That's the beginning of November, like November 5th or? Uh, November 6th? 4th, I think. 4th? Uh, well, don't quote me on that. Uh, that's right, November 4th. 4th I think yeah. I can have part some parts of this ready for November 4th. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, let's, um, any, before I go to Janet, anybody else <laughs> who hasn't had a, t a chance to speak? Um, great, let's go with Janet uh, quickly and then I wanna uh, turn it over to Laura. Yeah. So I don't, you know, when I was looking at the work plan, I thought that the drafting of the bylaw would be starting in January. And so I'm not to say that the planning department shouldn't be working on this because it's going to take a long time. But to me, it, you know, when I looked at the work plan, I thought we we're going to be looking at, you know, looking at the criteria and standards, I guess. But really, to me, a lot of this, you know, it was, which starts in November, it's like a lot of these things we can't make decisions on and we shouldn't make decisions on until we get a sense of what the community values are. And also, um, I think we need a lot more information. So like, for example, on slopes, you know, all these communities had different things for slope, right? And so part of that is, you know, erosion, but also part of that, you know, for Athol was, they didn't really want to look at thing on, things on ridges, right? And so, you know, I was thinking with Athol, it's like, what if the Holyoaks were covered with solar arrays? That's how they were sort of feeling about it. And so that's a community value or preference. And we're not going to know that until after the survey, but the slopes question to me is also a question of like, how has this worked out? Like, do you know, like some people were saying 10%, some 13%, does it matter what's on the ground? You know, if you're on Cape Cod and you're on a slope, maybe it's a sandy slope and so all well, the water goes in the ground. So I, I feel like I wouldn't want to start drafting this by a lot until we had more background information, like maybe some fact information we need, and then also to understand what the community wants. Because that kind I, of that kind yeah. of decision making is not gonna is gonna be about like what do people want to see screening? Do they you know whatever? I, mean, I hate to keep talking about the visual, but it just sort of it's an easy pick to talk about. I think in my mind, there's sort of these are separate issues. The drafting, um, you know, I, I'm envisioning a, a starting getting the drafting going fairly soon um, with. Uh, I'm not sure if you like yellow highlights or whatever, but highlighting areas that we need to deliberate on, we need to gather information, uh, and we need to, um, over time, get community engagement and, and input on, uh, and then fill in those gaps as we go forward. But the, the, the draft of the text is all sort of there with very clear areas that we have not decided on yet, uh, in terms of our role is not deciding but deciding on what we want to recommend to the to the to the planning department uh and so i don't want to be stuck with like drafting it and and filling in all those gaps in january i'd like to imagine uh just starting this this drafting process now and just very clearly highlighting those areas with with no numbers gaps uh so there's no sort of preset maybe maybe there could be some annotation there that's you know, refers to uh, three other different bylaws that give us a, a sense or some some uh, reference of what other bylaws have said uh, to give us some gu guidelines or some ideas, but clear areas where uh, exactly what you're saying, Janet, those are the things that we're going to need to deliberate on, gather information, look at other other uh, towns, look at our conditions, get input from the community, uh, to to finalize the actual figures or or specifications, but Chris, yeah, that... I was going to say there are certain parts of the bylaw that I think can be written today. Yeah, you know, that we don't need to have a lot of discussion about, or we don't need to have a lot of research about, um, yeah. and you know the that and as Dwayne said other parts of the bylaw we can leave blanks in, or we can write notes and say we got to check this out, see what we think here. But putting the structure together starting now, I think, is going to be important because there's, you know, if we wait till January, we don't know what's coming along in January. All kinds of things come by uh, our way. 
that we need to focus on. So um, it's better to start now and then, you know, make incremental progress as we move towards May. So I would happily start doing that. Chris, could you maybe for next meeting, and I don't want to give you work, but suggest like highlight what you think the issues are going to be like, you know, for, um, you know, just what are the issues that we might need more, you know, factual or science research on? Um, and what issues do we think that we're going to, will be, what is, you know, we'll, we're looking at the community values, the community engagement process to get input on. Cause I think, you know, I, I'm not opposed to us going through a 23 page bylaw with a lot of stuff, but I think it'd be good to focus on where are the hard parts, where are the decision points? And in, I'm, you know, for slopes, I'd be like, I need to know more about erosion or types of stuff or what towns have felt or their experiences have been, um, that kind of thing. And so that might be an easier way for us to focus. Like, yeah. here's here's what we think we have to decide. Yeah, let me leave, leave that up to Chris. I mean, obviously, I think, I think absolutely we want to get, uh, start getting fed uh, this information, th these, these issues. Um, uh, that we need, we as a body need to start deliberating on and researching and so forth. I'm not sure if it makes sense for Chris to try to come out with the whole list at the beginning, or just um, as we, as she, she and her staff go forward with drafting section by section to to highlight it as 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 they unveil themselves over time. So I, I'd sort of leave that to Chris and her staff with regard to what makes the most sense for her work, uh, how she likes to run run the staff. Okay, um, this is great, and I'm really excited and uh, about uh, starting to actually look at some bylaw language. And so, uh, Chris, obviously, you got a lot on your plate, but if there is um, any language that you can start us off with for in, in two weeks, that would be that would be super. Um, okay, uh, with that, let's. Um, I, I think these uh, uh, opportunities to have some uh, really useful uh, input for. Um, uh, issues associated with uh, with, with um, solar development, uh, decarbonization plans from the Commonwealth that we heard from before are really helpful for us to ground our um, discussions and deliberations moving forward. And uh, amongst us, we have Laura, who actually uh, knows her way around solar development, um, uh, unlike the rest of us some, to some extent. Um, and um, uh, so really look forward to the to uh, hearing from Laura on, on what she can uh, brief us on uh, when it, it really comes down to solar development. So uh, thank you, Laura. Sure, sure. Um, so what I'm going to do is I just put together some slides last night. Um, Great. And let's let's try to um, maybe about half an hour uh, and then we'll have time for public input as well. Can you see my screen? Yeah, can I just jump in real quick? Yeah, yeah, I, um, we seem to be having some technical difficulty with the meeting. There's a lot of dropouts. So I'm thinking while Laura is presenting, if people could turn off their video during the presentation, I think that might be helpful. Super. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. And also if Laura could speak closer to the microphone, I think that would help. Thanks. Probably you guys will get a close up of my pores. So here I am. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, I see that the topic on this agenda are sort of the more focused on the economics. Um, I'm happy to get into the economics, but I think just starting off sort of on how solar development works, just so everyone understands who the players are, the different stages of development, um, the timeline, everything that goes into it, I think is probably just a good um, backstop for everyone um, as we're going to develop these bylaws. So. Um, maybe what we'll do is, you know, I prefer an interactive presentation. Um, I think I can see hands. Um, I'll have to scroll down. I think it'll, people will shift if they have questions. But Stephanie, you have your hand up. I'm assuming that's an old one, right? All right, good. So taking it from the top here, just really, really high level, probably repetitive for, for many of you, but three sort of general stages or, or buckets of criteria when you're developing a solar project. And I've developed solar projects across the country, um, have been involved in all different stages from managing teams that do land acquisition to you know, developing the projects themselves to financing them, owning them, operating them and, and getting the commercial off takers. So um, I don't do any of that right now, um, which is great, which means that um, you know, I'm just gonna kind of inform you guys. 
Um, so, you know, Christine mentioned site control, you know, first stage, you know, sort of uh, ground level here, you know, working with a landowner, um, either a commercial landowner or an individual landowner uh, to control the site, either through a lease, which is about 85% of how all solar um, sites operate, and occasionally through a purchase and sale agreement. Development, and I'm going to get into the nitty gritty of this here, you know, high level interconnection, all the environmental diligence, the design, the permitting. Um, Massachusetts, we've got a great permitting system um, in this state, really respective of environmental concerns, uh, totally a contrast to many other states um, that solar is in. Um, tax agreements are, are solar owners negotiating pilot agreements with the town, you know, what's the tax structure? And then, of course, stakeholder engagement and, and all the local policy. Um, on the finance side, you're, you know, every time if I pulled up a project model for you, they're extremely complex. So there's multiple um, sort of inputs that go in to determine whether or not a solar project will be viable or not. And I'll start to speak to those, but I'm assuming there's a lot of going to be a lot of questions on that. But it's a it's a fairly complicated um, model. And it includes things like state incentives. In Massachusetts, um, we have sort of two programs. You either have the SMART program um, or you have the uh, net metering program. So if you're developing solar on, in Massachusetts, you're going to fall into one of those buckets. Residential, of course, always falls into the net metering program, um, sometimes a SMART program, but um, primarily net metering. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the commercial systems that we're looking at would fall into the SMART program. I'm gonna pause here a little bit and just say that the SMART program in mass, it's set up in a way where it's sort of like a, we'd call it a declining megawatt block program. So Massachusetts has been an early adopter of solar like New York. Um, and they, you know, this is the third program for solar that I've been a part of. The first two were called SREC1, SREC2, now we're into this SMART program. So the people who moved early into this SMART program had a higher incentive rate. As time goes on, that incentive rate for solar declines. It's called a declining megawatt block program. So the later you are, the less incentive you're getting. And I'll talk about that later on, but that's a, a big driver of the financing. And then finally, um, and I'll talk to you about the differences between solar developers long-term asset owners, tax equity partners, and then you have construction financing. Um, so um, tax equity is, a, is a, a, a portion of solar development. What essentially that means is just like fossil fuels have received uh, incentives for um, development more so than renewables for years, in the solar wind um, space, there are uh, federal tax incentives for developing solar projects. So that's a big part of the financing as well. Move it on unless there are questions. And if there are questions, we'll answer them. All right, so this is breaking it down a little bit further. And hopefully there's no typos. Okay, so the development process here, typically for an average, let's call it two to five megawatt system, which is probably the max you're gonna see in Massachusetts. Um, uh, two years of development timeline, it can, you know, it can vary. So this includes while you're, while you're developing a site, I think sort of the high level is, I would estimate that 50 to 60% of all projects get killed in the development phase for various reasons. And I'll talk a bit about those. So it is, it's, a, it's a sort of a higher risk endeavor meaning that you have to like uncover every stone before you actually have a project that might go through. Um, so you're getting all permits in hand. Conditional use permits are a big one that, that uh, Christine mentioned. Any other zoning related permits, all of these have been granted during this time. Any sort of environmental or cultural study, historic reviews, um, any permits, um, you know, you'll, you'll do um, phase one assessments, which is essentially looking at if there's any contamination on the site, you'll do wetlands delineation, floodplain review, endangered species, FAA, if you're close to any sort of, you know, airport um, to make sure there's no unwanted reflection. And then, of course, that historical and cultural review. Um, 
so a lot of components there. The interconnection I'm going to delve into a little bit more deeply, but this is, in I have seen, um, largely speaking, most projects fail because of either environmental issues, you know, there's a wetland and, you know, a site where you thought perhaps was developable and, and, and then you realize it's not, um, or um, the interconnection piece is a, is a really uh, common reason why projects don't um, come to fruition. So everything else might check out and then the interconnection comes back with a, with a really high cost from the utility um, and the project just can't withstand the, uh, the economics. Um, during development also, you're preparing the ALTA survey um, and a site plan, which takes into account, you know, all the zoning, basically everything in the bylaw that we're going to be creating. Um, and you're developing a plan based on all of the permitting constraints, uh, wherever you are. The incentives that I mentioned, so the Mass Smart program is what we would typically see for a, a, a typical ground mount solar project in, in Massachusetts. Um, when I talk about offtake, it's basically who's going to buy the power. So um, the, the most, I'd say, uh, for the most part in this area, most projects are what are called community solar projects. And um, it essentially means that the power that this, that a farm um, produces, half of it would go to some sort of commercial or municipal customer. And I think Amherst actually is a is a customer of one of these farms. Um, and the other half of the power would typically go to um, residential customers in the area. And the residential customers would receive a savings on their utility bill. Um, you know, there are other um, sort of contracts arranged where it feeds directly to the utility, but all of that sort of that construct fits into that mass uh, program and drive sort of the economics under a solar project. So we talked about site control and then financing close. So before you proceed to this, it's called NTP, notice to proceed, which is essentially the farm is construction ready. You need to have all of your financing in, in place. You need to know who the long-term asset owner is, which is called sponsor equity. You need to know who your tax equity partner is, and you need to have construction financing in place. Um, I want to just pause here because um, this is a sort of a misconception in the solar world. Sometimes you will find solar developers who also own the assets. A great example in Massachusetts would be Nexamp, um, very good developer, and they, they like to own the projects for the long term. Many times, the entity that's developing the projects are not set up to own the assets. So this is more common than not. So if, for example, a Borrego, which is now called New Leaf or a Blue Wave Solar is developing a project, they are going to sell the projects at this point, notice to proceed. So during this time, much of the project is de-risked. A lot of the work has been done. And then you're moving on to construction which typically takes nine months. And I think at this point it's, you know, you're, you're monitoring the site, the site's been mobilized, equipment's being delivered, um, you're testing, commissioning the site with the utility, um, and then you reach a point of mechanical completion. Um, yes, uh, actually, hold on, let me just finish the slide, Janet, and I'm gonna take your question. And then once the project is at mechanical completion and the utility comes out and they test the site, test the project to make sure it passes all the safety tests, it's producing the way they want it to produce. Then you declare COD, which is commercial operation. And at that point in time, um, uh, the long-term asset owner, you know, they've already stepped in at NTP, but um, this is when the project is really producing power to the grid. Okay, Janet, go ahead. So um, can you just go back for a little bit and talk a little bit about the incentives secured through the Mass Smart Program net metering yep. tariff? Just can you just go, I know, I know that changes, but could you go oh, explain it a great. little bit? Yeah, I'll go a little bit deeper on that. I think that's great. And I appreciate these questions because um, I don't want to overwhelm people with information, but I can, I can go as deep as you want. So in Massachusetts, you get essentially, depending upon what type of project you are, you fall into a certain incentive block. 
And right now, let's say that for a community solar project, again, half of the power purchaser is commercial or municipal and the other half is residential. Let's say your incentive is, I don't know, 15 cents a kilowatt hour. You can do things to increase that incentive. So the state requires, for example, um, they give a higher incentive when you have these residential off takers. They'll give you a higher incentive if you're developing on a brownfield. They'll give you a higher incentive if you're developing a canopy or a rooftop system. Um, and they'll give you a higher incentive if you're providing power to low income um, subscribers. So the block programs are like, it's, it's, it's dependent upon the time you come in and the utility that you're in and what region of the utility that you're in. So if you're in Eversource South, um, you know, you, or Eversource West, there are certain areas where that block program gets full very quickly. From my experience, Western Mass, and I grew up in the Berkshires, Western Mass and our region, certainly the Berkshires, have some of the lower incentive rates because while all of the costs to building a solar project are more or less the same, you know, panels are gonna be the same price whether you're developing, you know, outside of Boston or in Western Mass, the value of the power is different based on where you are. So, um, but that's how the declining block program works. So we're already, I think we're in, um, I don't know, we're, we're at a, the SMART program began years ago and we're pretty far out in terms of the blocks. And I think my understanding of Massachusetts right now is because we're a state that adopted solar early on, what you're gonna see in subsequent, the, the next slide here is that most of the ideal sites for solar have already been developed because this is, you know, I started developing projects in Massachusetts, um, I don't know, eight years ago. Um, and that was kind of like, that was even when SREC 1 had had, sun, has, had sunset and we were into SREC 2. So there's a tremendous saturation of solar projects in mass. Um, obviously we need more to reach our carbon neutral goals by, 20, by 2050. Um, but um, just to give you a sense of the solar incentives and how we've kind of worked through those over the years. Does that help, Janet? Yeah, and then I have a question. Do you think with the new federal bill and mm -hmm. the fact that our state is awash in money for some reasons I don't understand, yeah. that, so, that there'll be more money for solar coming in? Yeah, I'd like to think so. Right now, obviously the IRA is a massive bill that carves out $360 billion for um, renewables as well as like green hydrogen and you know different technologies that I'm not close to. Um, but what I'm seeing, um, and this is, you know, I, I, my personal sense is, I would like to say yes, um, but right now, and all the lawyers that I know are still digesting the IRA because it's a massive document. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of the really large utility scale projects immediately finding value. Um, I think it's gonna take some time. And, and when I say our, the, any project in mass is not the yard, like yard, the large utility scale projects that I'm mentioning. So um, for example, that project you sent around, um, Janet, and I, I'm actually familiar with that project on the Eastern shore of Virginia, 150 megawatts. That's a huge project. Mm -hmm. in, in contrast, projects in mass, two to five megawatts are, are much smaller. So I'm not yet seeing the IRA give a financial boost to um, projects of that scale, distributed generation projects is what we call them, as opposed to utility scale projects. Um, but I'm sure it will happen over time. I mean, I'd like to think so. But still, you know, we'll, we'll talk about interconnection. I mean, it's you can have all the money in the world dedicated to a project, uh, and it, it just is a matter of, is there land available? And is there interconnection capacity without a whole, you know, utility overhaul, so. Any other questions on this slide? Fire away, folks. <laughs> okay. So I wanna talk a little bit about the interconnection process. And this is literally just throwing together some maps. In um, most states, you don't have any visibility into 
what capacity is available um, in different substations, feeder lines, et cetera. In Massachusetts, it's required by the Public Utility Commission that you provide maps indicating where solar is available or not solar necessarily, you know, where capacity is available. So if you had looked at these maps years ago, on the left, for example, this is Eversource, it's not nearly as good as National Grid, you would see a lot more blue and green. So what this does, and, and I'll give you some real life examples. Um, you might have a, a site with a landowner who wants to develop solar in a community that's supportive. And, but if you, how it works is you do this desktop analysis for interconnection and you, you, know, you look at the Eversource maps or the national grid maps, I'm happy to provide these links to you guys. And you say, okay, where in Amherst can we develop solar, right? And you see in Amherst, which is primarily Eversource, um, you're not seeing a lot of availability. Also, Eversource is not showing you substations, which is pretty annoying. Then you say, okay, I think the site is, is decent and it has potential um, based on my desktop review someone would go out and look at the site and they'd actually confirm um, by looking at the lines, what the, you know, is it a three phase line? You know, wh uh, what does it look like? You know, is it, is it 15 KV? You know, what, what is that interconnection point? And, um, and then you would make an application to the utility. There's a fee for that application and they would do what's called a pre-study. And the pre-study would say, roughly speaking, you know, here's what we see. Um, and you say, okay, this either meets my criteria um, or not. You know, some things that you see regularly are going to be things like, well, there might be capacity. Um, one of the one of the lines needs to be upgraded. And how does the utility think about that? Do they think about it as there's going to be a cost sharing between the developer and the utility? Is it going to be? You know, I've seen interconnections come back anywhere from you know, the great $300,000 ones to like, there was one on my wall in the office. It was like, this will be a $15 million upgrade. Like that's never gonna happen. Um, so they really, they range. And um, it's not until you do a full study with the utility and you pay the money for a full study, do you actually know the timeline for the project to get interconnected, how much work needs to be done um, and what the cost is. So and this is why I say that development sort of phase is pretty risky because you're you're putting real dollars out um, without knowing what the results are going to be. So the utilities have a tremendous amount of power here. They're not necessarily totally forthcoming um, as the consultants indicated with like, um, so in New York, for example, they've done things like identified priority zones, which is great because you know there's a priority zone here in the state, which means that this is where the state wants development to go. And that's largely based on the capacity that's available and the load that is there. Massachusetts doesn't have that. Um, so, so this is a summary of sort of the desktop review. And I think what was not surprising, but also you know, a bit frustrating to me, our, our utility lines are, are very old. Um, the transmission system in this country, I'm sure none of this is surprising to you, uh, require massive uh, updates. So there's not a lot of um, availability. We're seeing a lot of deep red lines here um, where like a lot of the, if you think of capacity, it's almost like, um, I think of it as, or how it was taught to me, you know, when I was early in my twenties and working in the energy field, it's, it's like a highway. So um, when you say you want to connect at a certain point, the utility is going to be looking at how many cars are already on that highway how dense is it? Can I bring you on as well? And how many people are already ahead of you? Because when you make that, that application to the utility to connect your solar system, there might be five other projects ahead of you of various sizes. So, um, so you know, it's, it's about, there's, there's a lot of studying that goes in to even beginning the development phase of solar. Um, and I'm gonna pause there and see if you guys have questions. And then we'll just sort of open it up for questions. I did it. <laughs> These are probably very basic questions. Yeah. So, um, so is so is this the does this is this one of the reasons the push for more batteries on site? Correct. 
You got so, it. So because the utility is like, yeah. yeah, we don't need any more energy yeah. from three to five on a summer's day, but we'll yeah. take it at seven or 11. Yeah. Yep. So, so oh. that's exactly right. So batteries have the potential to, um, to basically take the solar power, store it, and then deploy it when it's most needed. Um, and, and that's right. And I, you know, you're not going to hear me say that battery technology now is where it needs to be. Um, you know, solar is such a mature technology. Um, batteries are fairly new. Um, so the big things with batteries are going to be, you know, we're working on a, um, so I, I'm involved in more real estate with solar right now. Um, but I know of these three big projects in Eastern Mass where there are the, these, these battery systems that accompany the solar. Solar has been mechanically complete for a year. And because the battery systems are so remote, um, when you have a remote battery system, typically you have a, you have like a hard line of communication with the batteries to the utility. Um, and because it's like wireless, they're having great difficulty making sure the batteries are communicating with the utility in real time. So, but you're right, that would ease the um, congestion on our grid. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, hi, Laura. Uh, thanks. Um, just a quick question, then a, a, a comment. Um, so just so I reading, understanding this, this uh, map here, the, the um, caption uh, on the left, yeah, uh, so, on the DG hosting, DG yeah. hosting, are those is when it says like one to two, three fades, is that one to two megawatts uh, availability? Or what is the unit? No, these are the types of, these are the lines that are available. Um, so like the, the number, the number of lines that are like how much, so you need to look at this as how much capacity is there available? If there was a ton of capacity available, you'd see lots of blue, you know, probably how it was 10 years ago. Yeah, Think of okay. It as, how, as how congested, how congested the lines are. So the left is Eversource, the right is National Grid. National Grid provides far more detail um, on, on what's available. And they also provide these little blue dots, which are substations. So in addition to the capacity that's available, another significant driver of cost is going to be how long do you have to run your lines? Yep. So, and, and frequently you'll have a solar developer that says, hey, I want to develop a project. I could connect to this substation or maybe I feed into this substation. It just depends on what's available. And sometimes the utility will give you options. Great, thank you. And, and let, me, let me just, um, we can, can actually continue this next, meeting um i'm not sure how much more you have but this is really helpful for us okay. uh, but That's i do want to i, I do want to end at like 250. Sure. um uh you can keep going a little bit but at least no. 250 uh so we can have some time for public input yeah no i, I assume there will be questions from the public so um and i know there was a lot of questions on financing i'm happy to address those it's it's fairly i'll make it as simple as possible um but i think one of the things that keeps coming up also in these discussions is this concept of selling a solar facility. Um, depending upon the developer, you'll be able to tell immediately uh, when a developer makes an application to the town, if they own assets or if they typically, if their business model is to develop solar and then to sell at notice to proceed, or if their business model is to develop and own the assets. And it's, and you can find amazing developers that have developed so many projects that are excellent developers. And likewise, um, you'll find many asset owners who are also developers, but those tend to be bigger shops, so. Great, would you be um, willing and would it, people be interested in large just continuing this in, in, in two weeks as an agenda item? Let's see if there's any other questions, Dwayne. I don't want to bore people, but yes. If you no, no we're questions. not at all bored at all. We're being well educated, quite frankly. So thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Bob. Though you're muted. You're muted. Bob, you're muted. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Um, this was excellent. Very technical, so I couldn't capture it in the notes. Will this be available to Stephanie, sure. please? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll thank send you. That to to Stephanie, yeah. And then you guys, maybe what we do is you sort of like compile your questions and then we can talk about it more on the next meeting. Well, yeah, actually, if we if we, um, if we we can distribute the slides ahead sure. of the meeting, uh, we can sort of uh, go through them uh, to finish up to, uh, at the at, in two weeks, uh, but also have questions um, uh, uh, set up uh, ahead of time. So that'd be great. Thank you, Laura. Um, 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess we can uh, show ourselves again. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Janet, one question. Is that for uh, Laura? Yeah, it's it, in the map that you showed for um, National Grid, were the black lines the maxed out lines? Um, I couldn't, I don't understand the um, the oh, units. Right. Like when you, you were showing like on the left side was Eversource and the right side I think was National Grid. Or, mm -hmm. Yep. So the black lines are the maxed out lines or? Yeah, the black lines are those that are like um, overwhelmed. Okay. Uh, with capacity, yeah. 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 Okay, great. So um, let's um, put this on pause um, and continue in, in, in two weeks. Um, but let's move to the uh, next agenda item, uh, which is um, basically just to schedule the next meeting. Um, and I, I blocked it on exactly what we had decided. Uh, but you know, the, the primary option in front of us is to continue at this time, which is one o'clock to three o'clock uh, on on every uh, on on two weeks Friday, um, I'm fine with that. But I I just want to toss out there because uh, I do have a conflict for the rest of the semester. At least it happened. My my department meeting got scheduled for this time slot, <laughs> um, and I can meet miss those. But if I don't need to, that would be great. Uh, but I don't want to mess mess up a good thing here. Uh, but let me just ask um, if if people are available instead of starting at one to start at eleven thirty on Friday. No, that nobody has a problem with that. Yeah, Laura. Sorry, You're I just muted. need to look. I just need to look. <laughs> Hold on. So it would be the fourth um, at eleven thirty. Yeah, and and just continue that yeah. for the next at least through the semester. Uh, that. Works for me. Awesome. Okay, so that we can uh, feel free to bring a lunch and uh, eat along. Uh, so, Jack, are you okay with that or another comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, I won't be available. Oh, I have yeah some personal issues that. Um, would won't we'll be would able that, to make it so okay would that be the case for the one o'clock as well yeah yeah i'm i'm okay. I'm, I'm in california okay had, uh, had a death a death in the family uh, so okay sorry to hear that yeah. yeah okay okay um okay so we'll miss you one way or the other uh in two weeks um but uh but yeah let's let's put in the minutes that we'll meet at 11 30 uh two fridays from now uh, and then just block that off for the next several Fridays uh, every two weeks. Uh, and we'll go 11.30 to 1.30 and I'll be able to go to my department meeting, at least uh, zoom into it. So that'd be great. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, with Stephanie's help, can we, Chris, do you have a, 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 a comment? I just wanted to ask Stephanie, um, I had in my notebook that we were going to discuss the memo from Jonathan Murray uh -huh. on the 4th and um discuss the memo without Jonathan Murray being here and if he is going to be here do we need to check with him that 1130 is okay we can we can check with him okay All okay right. let's yeah let's check with him and then and then um conf hopefully confirm that that works for him and then and then we'll stick with that if that doesn't work Stephanie let me know <laughs> okay uh great uh and we'll put that down as an agenda item for uh next uh in two weeks Okay, um, Stephanie, do you want to um, open it up for any thoughts or comments or questions from the public? Sure. So, if anyone from the public has um, any questions for the committee or follow up comments, please digitally, electronically raise your hand. Unmute you. Yeah. Stephanie, do you want to say for the record how many attendees we have? Well, we have eight. I think so. It said we had nine at one point, but I think we had at least two people showed up twice, unless they <laughs> shared their link with someone else. But in any case, it says I'd go with eight, <laughs> safely go with eight. Thank you. Okay, Mike Lipinski, I have unmuted you. 
you're free to speak. No, you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Hi, uh, Mike Lipinski, 167 Shoots Ferry Road. And uh, great presentation, Laura, really enjoyed it. I have one question for you about that later, if, if I get a moment. But um, I just want to rewind back to the very beginning of the meeting, the ECAC portion of it. And I just want to alert members of the Solar Bylaw Committee that anytime you hear a member of ECAC use the words, our share of solar, that alarm bells should be going off in your head. In the past, members of this group have generated estimates of Amherst share of solar based on what I consider false assumptions and very questionable formulas. A simple analysis of their formulas that they have used to determine Amherst share of solar made it clear that their estimates were not based in reality. And unfortunately, in the past, some of these ECAC estimations have been referred to by members of various town boards in print and at public meetings. And one of those numbers thrown around is 300 acres of ground mounted solar is Amherst share of statewide decarbonization goals. In fact, that 300 plus acre number was used as an argument against the temporary moratorium on ground mounted solar early in the year. That number was used by opponents at various meetings and it was also used by town council members as a reason to vote against failed proposal. The reality is that there's no simple formula for calculating the town of Amherst share of ground mounted solar. As Laura has explained quite well, citing for ground mounted solar, it's an extremely complicated exercise, much more dependent on grid capacity and geography than what some individuals in town view as Amherst's share. This attempt by ECAC to work low, medium, and high levels of ground-mounted solar scenarios into the solar siting study. It's just another version of this need they have to try to determine Amherst share. In my opinion, adding these solar scenarios to the study makes little sense. And I would hope that the Solar Bylaw Working Group would agree that it is well outside the scope, the scope of the solar siting study. And then I just have one question based on Laura's presentation that perhaps she could clarify something. Can I ask that now? Sure, yeah, please. Okay, uh, Laura, one, in one specific case, which is curious because it deals with a, a real life situation here in Amherst, the, the uh, Shootsbury Road project that was withdrawn a year ago. It's very clear based on the on your map that you showed of uh, the Eversource uh, three-phase line, that the three-phase line is nowhere near that uh, 160, that 67 Shootsbury Road site. It's a, at least a mile away in both directions. My understanding is that the cost for that is probably about a million dollars per mile for three-phase and probably going up. Uh, do you have any um, insight into why a company would propose a site so far away from a three-phase connection that they would have to spend, you know, upwards of a million dollars to put it in? Yeah, I think I would respond sort of a two-pronged response. The first is these maps are totally not accurate. I mean, yeah. like they are a general view, but um, the power resides in the utility. I don't know if they conducted a pre-study already, but um, the maps are to be used as like guides, but certainly not definitive, um, you know, but, you know, this is why you have to engage with the utility. This is why when the consultant said, oh, we'll look at cost upgrades, I was like, wonderful. You figured out a way to do this. I've been in this industry for 18 years and I, and I haven't met anyone with the, uh, with the Oracle. Um, and the second piece is um, a million dollar interconnection is not bad. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, it's, it's really um, depending upon like the project itself, in Massachusetts, um, that would not be atypical. Um, so just for, for reference. Okay, thank you. Renee Ross? 
I would allow you to speak. Please unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, wonderful, informative meeting today. Um, I just want to put in a strong um, comment about um, just encouraging the the consultants and the committee to really um, have robust community engagement um, and um, to really, I, I think somebody had mentioned in the beginning how, you know, certain groups in the community would be um, engaged to, um, you know, to, 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 for, you know, public, you know, for access to, um, to give input into this. And I would hope it will be really inclusive and the outreach will be very obvious and, um, you know, all groups, all individuals will, will, will be included in this. I think it's so important. And I was wondering if there's a way for the public to actually help um, with the decision as to what questions will be asked in a general survey to the public. So it's just strongly urging you to include the public because uh, we know this is Amherst and we do have a lot of concerned people. Um, and yeah, so basically that's it. And again, thank you for a very informative meeting. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else from the public attendees? Uh, Renee, it looks like you raised your hand again because I know I lowered your hand. So I'm going to, oh, okay. Uh, is there anyone else? Yeah. I'm um, just, yeah, just seeing the public first, but um, mm. it does not look like the public has any additional comments. Great. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for, for the comments uh, that were made. Um, uh, that's very important. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, uh, I see Martha's hand up and then we can uh, move to adjourn. Yep. Yeah. So just, just to follow up on, on Renee's question, Stephanie, is there a potentially a way that um, members of our community could submit, um, you know, questions they would like to see raised or other things? Is there any way to submit that to the website or any way for you to uh, distribute it or anything like that? Yeah, I'll have to work with the consultants on that because I think it's also a matter of what capacity they have. You know, we'll we probably could maybe have something um, on Engage Amherst, which we've done with other. Okay. Where we can ask people to submit comments. Um, that could be one of the ways, and we could also, again, I I think we'd have to work that out with the consultant, but I'm sure there are ways we can do that. Yeah. So is that something you could? follow up then as they yeah, go it's up. something I would yeah I would absolutely I mean I'm I'm very much about wanting to engage with everybody yeah. in town not just yeah the people who live next door are homeowners <laughs> like <laughs> renters have a lot of stake in them yes yes yeah thank you all right good um Janet you're lucky we got two more minutes uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to ask so many questions it's one of my qualities um can, could we see a Stephanie could you send us a copy of the GZA like I don't know if it's the proposal or their work plan because I was um yep. trying to educate myself by looking at um Dwayne's website and so I thought that was a great background in terms of questions and process and I would love to see what they're planning to do I learned a lot about solar assessments and so I just love to see that document Sure. Um, I just need to, our procurement officer has been out this mm. week, and I think I had mentioned that. I'm not sure, but um, I can't send it until I double check with them to make sure. Okay. But once I once I get the clearance, I, I will send it. Great. Okay. <laughs> well, great meeting, uh, everybody. And um, um, I don't think I need an emotion, a motion to adjourn. <laughs> we can do that before. I think everybody would be fine with that. Um, but let me just say thank you again. Uh, this is a great, a great group um, and great um, thoughts and and um, expertise to bring to this uh, uh, table. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for the engagement with the planning uh, department and and your leadership on on that uh, drafting and so forth. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting 
engaged in the actual language and and figuring out what the hard questions are we need to talk about and so forth um, and get into that over the course of the next uh, number of, uh, of of weeks and months. Um, uh, Laura, just thank you so much for your uh, putting that together and starting that presentation. I do want to revisit that and continue that in um, in, in two weeks. Uh, we'll also hear from uh, KP Law. If I understand correctly, Lauren, Chris, this is in, in response to the questions that we put forward to them with regard to um, uh, just guidelines on what what can and might not be able to go into zoning bylaws and so forth. Uh, so that's really going to be helpful to us as well. Uh, so with that, um, thank you, everybody, and see you in two weeks. Uh, we'll plan to convene at 1130. S Stephanie will send out all those in information. Uh, unless we hear differently, but plan on 1130. Okay. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.